Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, good evening to people elsewhere in the world. Um, and thank you very much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. I'll be talking about some, uh, some thoughts around quantitative modeling in, uh, as it applies to drug development, with particular emphasis on, uh, on Alzheimer's disease. So some preamble first and um, getting my excuses in early. Uh, this presentation really reflects uh, some personal thoughts on, on, on my part. Um, I'll concentrate mostly on Alzheimer's disease. Um, there are several reasons for this. Um, personally, I, I have the most experience with this particular disease uh, in the context of drug development. And also, it has a relatively rich history in the field. There have been a number of trials over the past 10 years or more, and I think it provides not only a rich uh, set of experience, but hopefully an opportunity to maybe learn some lessons. So it's a good, a good case study, and as we'll see, it's a, it's a relatively complex disease as well, uh, which I think uh, provides some, some particular challenges from a modeling perspective. And hopefully some of what I'll talk about will generalize to other disorders as well. And, and also I'm not a modeler, so I'm speaking more here as an interested customer of modeling and uh, related quantitative developments, but hopefully it's a useful perspective. And again, I'll emphasize that these are my, are my thoughts and opinions and they don't represent um, any particular position of Takeda or anybody else. So on with the show. This is an outline of what I'll be talking about um, for the next uh, uh, 40 minutes or so. Um, I'll talk a little bit initially about some practicalities um, for drug development. I think it's useful to get those out there um, at the start because when we're developing new tools and certainly more uh, new modeling tools, um, the considerations are often uh, theoretical ones. So, you know, will it improve? Uh, the technical performance of, of a trial that in some respect or another uh, most often uh, we think about improving the power of the of the statistical uh, analysis of that particular trial but there are a number of practical aspects as well that, that come into play when we're actually running these in, in a commercial context which is what uh, the, the vast majority of drug development is and so I'll, I'll just mention a couple of things there to maybe put some some thoughts in your mind as well uh, I'll then talk a bit about disease models uh, in the context of clinical trial simulation, uh, how they can help, how they can fit in, and again, some considerations. I'll then kind of flip to the other end of the, the spectrum in a way, rather than talking about the whole, the whole disease in toto, um, can we, to what extent can we get an individualized uh, prognoses and uh, what are some of the, the issues there and, and also how that could help if we could, if we could achieve that in the context of trials. I'll talk a bit about subtypes as well. This is something that I think has been of uh, increasing interest in recent years and has been an interest of mine as well. And finally, I'll talk about uh, copathologies, which I think in Alzheimer's disease is really uh, where the field needs to be thinking a lot more um, in, in the coming years. So first, some, some reflections on um, the practicalities. And uh, I'll use as an example here um, the context of enriching a clinical trial. And one way of doing this is to use uh, measurement of hippocampal volume as an inclusion criterion, as a screening criterion for the trial. And um, this is actually a, an approach that has worked well, it stood the test of time. It is very robust for this particular utility. And I'm, I'm thinking here particularly in, in MCI, so people who have some measurable memory impairments clinically, but uh, are not, have not yet reached the stage of frank dementia. Um, and the, you know, there, are, there are a number of biomarkers that can actually uh, do similar, which sort of brings in a, another consideration, which one should we use, or which combination should we use, and we'll come back to that point. But hippocampal volume is one that works well. And uh, on the basis of many, many years of evidence over a number of trials, um, I was involved in an effort some years ago that actually achieved a a regulatory biomarker qualification of this approach. This was by the European Medicines Agency, basically saying that yes, the evidence stacks up, and if sponsors wish to use this, uh, we, we sort of we think this is a good idea and something that is likely to, to help. And of course, the, uh, the decision rests with the trial sponsor. But 
well that's um, well that's uh, submission really concentrated on the technical performance i.e does it work and does it generalize across different data sets um, there are a number of other aspects that come into play when when one is thinking about using it in a, in a clinical trial and again this is this particular example is hippocampal volume based enrichment but i think a lot of these considerations generalize to other enrichment uh, other enrichment mechanisms and potentially other other uses of biomarkers as well and this is really what i like to call uh, the concept of operationalizing of the method you may be thinking about for the, for the use in trials. And in this particular example, the title of the paper here on the right gives you sort of some example of some of the things we were considering, um, the effective algorithm. Uh, as you all know, there are many different software, uh, software tools out there for measuring hippocampal volume. And so if we use one algorithm or another, does it make a difference? Uh, test free test variability, the intrinsic measurement variability of the of the test, in this case, the measurement of hippocampal volume. How does that affect performance? And then the choice of cut point. This is an enrichment uh, context of use here we're talking about. So the idea is you're going to measure somebody's hippocampal volume in the screening phase of a trial, and you're going to make a decision. They're either in or they're out. So you need some sort of decision point, a cutoff value. And, and what does that uh, what are the implications of that? And then by performance, what I'm talking about here is really um, some of the practical considerations like uh, trial cost, trial duration, uh, as well as the sample size. And you know, this is it's an interesting problem. It's not a, a hugely difficult problem, but I think it, you do need to think about how some of the different impacts of enrichment um, trade off in terms of some of these outcomes. So, for example, if you have an enriched sample, by definition, you're going to be enrolling fewer subjects into the, into the trial. So your, the maintenance phase of the, of the trial uh, may have some time and cost savings. You're going to be uh, basically uh, paying for fewer subjects to have procedures during the, during the time in which they're enrolled in the trial. But on the other hand, the screening phase is potentially more complicated, may take longer, uh, and maybe more costly. And so you can essentially trade all, all these things off. And, and of course, we're going to have an increased screen fail rate as well, um, which needs to be appropriately modeled ahead of time, because once you start a clinical trial in an, in an industry context, um, staying on track in terms of your predicted enrollment, it becomes a, a, a very, very important consideration. Time is literally money at this point, not only uh, because it's a competitive industry and maybe other companies have uh, trials ongoing simultaneously and maybe get maybe get to market or get authorization first but also uh, the patent clock is ticking uh, already and you, know, you may be getting to the stage where you're already halfway through your your time of patent exclusivity on the compound which is the whole the whole basis of uh, the, the private sector pharmaceutical company business model. So all these things come to bear over and above the, the pure science of can we technically do a slightly better trial. And so this is, these are the sorts of things we need to trade off. Um, and so we worked these through in this particular example. Um, and it was quite an interesting exercise, actually. Um, so you see on these graphs at the bottom here, on the left, we have the effect size. So this is the actual statistical effect size that normally we try. Um, the first thing we do is try and improve that with any enrichment effort. And on the, all of these graphs on the x-axis here is, a, uh, is basically a cut point. Uh, in this particular analysis, it, it was expressed as a hippocampal volume, an adjusted hippocampal volume, um, on basically as a, as a percentile of a, a healthy normal distribution. And so it went from a sort of a 50th percentile of healthy normals, where you might be enrolling, say, I forget, maybe 75, 80% of MCI subjects, um, right down to a very stringent cut point towards the left, towards you know, a limit of zero, where you may be enrolling a very small fraction, the people with only the very smallest hippocampi. And what's interesting is that you see the, the actual statistical effect sizes relatively um, consisted across this fairly wide range of cut points. Maybe a hint that the Biggest effect size is found around, say, 10% here, 10th percentile. 
Um, but, but, but the effect is actually quite modest. And that's important because when you start getting into the, some of these practical trade-offs, the second graph is the, essentially a, a, a reflection of the screen fail rate, but it's expressed as the number needed to screen to achieve your enrollment target. And this is normalized that the, the horizontal dashed lines here and all these graphs are the unenriched scenario. So this was sort of normalized sort of as a fraction of what it would be in the case of not using any enrichment. And you can see that it's kind of number needed to screen neutral, this approach for a wide range of cut points down to about 20%. But then as you start getting more and more stringent, this starts to blow up because you're getting so uh, so picky with the people that you're uh, wanting to enroll that you, you're screen failing so many people that basically that trade-off starts um, working against you. And we could also be a lot more practical as well and talk about dollars and cents and, and, and months and years, which is what the trial cost and trial duration calculations were based on certain assumptions, but these were assumptions that were drawn from actual clinical trial experience and clinical trial examples. And what's interesting for trial cost is you see that this works out actually as a cost savings. You're saving maybe 20 to 30% of the cost off over a wide range, again, a very shallow curve here, a wide range of cut points, although this tends to sort of get less advantageous towards the more stringent end of the, the spectrum. But for trial duration, what's interesting, and again, this is based on certain assumptions, which you can tweak in the model, but for the assumptions we made, which are in the paper, um, you don't actually make the, the overall trial any faster, again, for a wide range of, of cut points. And then at the more stringent end of, of the enrichment criteria, this starts blowing up, and you actually take longer overall and so despite the fact that the statistical effect size may be slightly higher at, at a cut point around five or 10 percentile of, of normal, maybe a cut point around 30 or 40, you still get an uh, advantage. The number needed to screen, you're not being penalized. You're gaining in terms of cost and the overall trial duration is, is, is basically the same as what it would be. And the reason for this trial duration being what it is, is primarily that the additional time needed to screen is uh, uh, being counteracted by the fact that you need to screen fewer people. And so this overall duration between first subject in and last subject out is reduced, but they kind of cancel out. So you're not winning overall. And, you know, an individual company may interpret these and make decisions on these as they will, but I think it's important to have all these, not only the technical considerations, but the practical considerations laid out as well. So this is one particular example here, uh, that of enrichment by hippocampal volume, but one can easily see how you could generalize these sorts of considerations to other uh, clinical trial um, tools as well. So with that, I'll move on to the, the second part of, of, of the talk, which is around the concept of disease models and the use of clinical trial simulation tools. Now, of course, you can take data from any data that have me or whatever and, um, and run some simulations. And do the we do that all the time. Um, but I think there's also an advantage in tools that are, um, that first of all, draw on more data. And second of all, have some degree of, um, shall we say, a, a, a broader buy-in. Uh, and this is one example that was developed again by the, uh, the Critical Path Institute. Um, who mediated a, uh, a consortium which brought together a range of people. And this was in parallel to that enrichment uh, exercise I, I spoke about previously. Um, brought together data as well as stakeholders, not only from industry, but from regulatory bodies, um, uh, thought leaders from academia as well. Uh, the idea being to serve as something as a, neut of a neutral broker and develop a tool that is not particularly Takeda's secret source or Pfizer's secret source or whoever, but it's something that's more transparent, um, has been essentially has had buy-in by a number of different uh, competing parties. So it's not biased to one particular company or scenario, but it's more generally applicable. And, I, and what was important here is that this went through the formal regulatory re review process and was blessed by both the European Medicines Agency, but also the, the FDA and the United States. And so I think what this tells us is that this is something that has 
you know, a degree of uh, vetting and uh, and buy-in. And so this particular tool, this is back in 2015, so it's a few years ago now, this particular tool has basically been blessed by regulators and can support a number of different trial designs that can be used then to, um, to design a trial that is then brought before the regulators for, uh, for discussion. And that avoids a lot of sort of individual case-by-case -case discussion. The fact that you have a tool, a drug development tool that has been um, already pre-vetted by the agencies. Now, this particular example uh, has has some limitations. It's five years old now. Uh, this particular one only considered ADAS COG as the outcome uh, as the outcome uh, measurement. And of course, we know that these days uh, clinical trials are moving earlier and earlier in disease, and and partly at the request of agencies like the FDA, we're considering other outcome measures, not just purely uh, cognitive ones, but um, outcome measures reflecting quality of life, for example, uh, are increasingly of, of interest to, to be able to demonstrate a maybe a more uh, practical patient level benefit rather than something that's a bit more abstract, like a, a cognitive performance, which we hope will translate into some sort of quality of life outcome. Now, biomarker data weren't weren't included in this um, in this model either, and but there was a good practical reason for that. It's not that we didn't want to include it. It's that at that stage, the data sets available didn't have a consistent use uh, consistent use of biomarkers, and so that was difficult to to bring together in a consistent way. Also, it only covered um, MCI and AD clinical stages uh, at that point because a lot of the trials, or the trial data that was brought to bear on that model. Was, was predominantly in the later stages of, of disease. And so it, you know, this particular model may not reflect current thinking around clinical trials in AD, uh, as I mentioned, uh, pre-symptomatic stages of the disease are now increasingly of interest. Um, it's now routine to use amyloid positivity or other sorts of biomarker-based enrollment. Uh, there's been a lot more thinking about heterogeneity in subgroups in AD, as well as more advanced trial designs that I think we would like to be able to, to simulate, ideally using a tool that has been had wide input and, and wide acceptance rather than um, just some in-house calculations. But you know, to that end, this essentially a similar sort of pre-competitive consortium is, is continuing to work with more recently available data to get at some of these uh, some of these aspects as well. So like all science, this is an ongoing exercise but generally speaking I think a lot of the, the, the features of this particular tool are, are very good ones and, and I think something to think about um, as new methods are developed that maybe you think are uh, actually worthy of use then there is this sort of next step which is one of bringing that together in a, in a pre-competitive sense to get broad buy-in and ideally uh, uh, regulatory vetting as a not just as a software method or a published paper, but as an actual piece of software that has been blessed as an actual drug development tool. And so I think, again, that sort of practical next step is an important thing to bear in mind. But there are also some, some other considerations. Um, I'm expressing these here in, in, the con in the context of clinical trial development tools, but they actually, a lot of these are very, very general considerations, again, from a practical performance, a practical consideration. Um, you know, with anything, if we're going to be making you know decisions that potentially could have the company on the hook for hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, you know, these are big trials, expensive investments. So we need to be very, very sure that the performance of a particular method isn't just uh, you know works well, for example, in ADME, but doesn't generalize very well. We need to have confidence that it's robust and its performance generalizes across a number of different data sets, um, across different ethnicities and geographies as well. There may be some subtleties that are, that are missed, for example, in ADNI, which is uh, up to now has been uh, essentially a North American exercise and, and has drawn primarily from a certain demographic, which may not represent the wider world, even within the US, certainly uh, more generally. And there are interesting considerations as well about biomarker data as we think to integrate biomarker data. 
Uh, there are lots of complexities there as well that need to be thought through. Um, maybe the most robust way of using biomarks is, is in sort of a positive negative way, um, like the, the more recently proposed ATN framework, which is essentially positive and negative on amyloid tau or neurodegeneration. Now, for many of us, that seems like a gross oversimplification, but one advantage of doing that is that it might be more robust to different ways of measuring those particular outcomes, as well as robust across different data sets. It would be nice to be able to bring in more continuous measures of uh, whatever the biomarker is measuring, but there is the consideration of exactly how do we compare these different measures, these different assays, these different algorithms, uh, different types of scanner, whatever it might be, different traces in the case of PET. And this is where something like norms and, and, and Z-scores, which have been increasingly used in recent years, um, cognitive outcomes, but also I'm, I'm very pleased to see it have been increasingly thought about in the context of brain atrophy. And I think, and then now increasingly with other biomarkers as well. And, uh, and for me, this is a really, really nice development. It's, uh, it's a way of putting basically these measurements on, a, on a, a measuring stick that is relatively intuitive. I think we can all uh, interpret very uh, fairly well the idea of so many standard deviations below or above the, uh, a normative reference range with suitable correction for variables like age and head size, whatever, whatever else. And I think this sort of thing really is a very um, relatively simple, but I think has a lot of mileage in terms of being able to compare measurements across uh, different types of biomarker measurement. Because the fundamental issue remains with a lot of what we want to measure in Alzheimer's disease, certainly uh, clinical outcomes are notoriously variable. Um, showing some curves on the left here for ADAS COG, um, which is why we need these trials of maybe 1,500, 2,000 people in, in phase three Alzheimer's uh, disease, because the, the, the primary outcome is very, very variable. And uh, biomarkers, particularly imaging biomarkers, are generally better behaved from a measurement science perspective, but still there is an increasing uh, intrinsic uh, variability in these, in these trajectories. And what this means is that the traditional way of doing um, a clinical trial is, you know, we, we do some relatively clever statistics in terms of um, uh, uh, covariance and so forth and, and repeated measures. I'm just showing here baseline and endpoint basically for a, a made up clinical trial, but you're still struggling against this variability. And, and in this cartoon, these, these Gaussians that I'm showing here, I did actually try and scale these um, based on real clinical trial data for changes in ADAS COG over 18 months. Um, I exaggerated the treatment effect, but the, um, but the spread here is, is real. And you can see that in the, just in the placebo case, there is, uh, you know, on average, you're getting maybe a five or six point, maybe a seven point change in ADAS COG over 18 months, but uh, you know, some subjects, a considerable portion, are actually going the other way based on the pure measure measurements. So there's a lot of noise here, which is why we need such huge trials. Biomarkers, again, this this is based on the, the, the spread here, but not the treatment effect. It's based on, on, on real data. So you tend to do a little bit better in terms of your uh, theoretical power for a biomarker, presuming that, of course, the treatment affects it. This is temporal load volume from volumetric MRI again based on a recent uh, a recent trial uh, but still you're essentially doing this sort of you know a group mean average for the treated cohort against the group mean average for the placebo co cohort oversimplifying slightly but essentially that's the idea and so you know let's maybe step back and think from a sort of science fiction perspective what would we like to be able to do what how could we sort of get around this this power issue and one way, a very nice way that if it could be achieved, is the notion of an individualized prognosis. Can we predict the trajectory of an individual person uh, and how would that help uh, clinical trials? So again, at this sort of cartoon level, uh, on the left is the same graph as previously. This doesn't have to be ADAS-COG, this could be any outcome measure, but this is sort of taken from that on, on the left here. We're basically, as I said, we're doing statistics based on your observed values, but 
if we could predict to a high degree of accuracy somebody's change over a relevant period of a clinical trial, um, essentially whether this works or not comes down to how much gain we're getting in the spread of values when these values are essentially uh, the delta rather than the raw observed value. So in other words, we say um, what we predict versus what we observe. Um, how well does that work? And if it works well, again, theoretically speaking, um, in your placebo arm, if you do, if your method is doing a really great job of predicting the amount of decline, then the difference between predicted and observed is a, is a, a nice narrow Gaussian um, centered roughly on, on zero. This is the, the case if, if things are working really, really well. Uh, and if you have treatment that works, then you're sort of you've got a Gaussian that basically shifted off. And because these Gaussians are hopefully much narrower, you're gaining in statistical power. So that's kind of the value proposition of this, if we can achieve it, and, uh, and if these, these Gaussians can be narrowed sufficiently. And I know there's been a lot of work in the field, a lot of thinking, certainly amongst the most uh, theoretical sort of computer science uh, ends of, the, of, this, uh, of this, uh, this community. But there are a number of you know, obviously <laughs> limitations and challenges to doing this. Uh, again, this is something that personally I would love to have. And I think there are obvious uh, benefits for um, sort of real world applications and actual public health as well. Not only in a clinical trial to make a clinical trial technically better, but there is a big argument that if somebody, if you can determine that somebody's, they might have Alzheimer's disease or something similar, but you can predict they're not gonna get much worse for the next five years. Um, we shouldn't be spending the uh, the health system's money or exposing that that individual to potential side effects and risk of taking a treatment if it's not going to if there's if there's no improvement to be had because they're not going to be getting getting any worse. So there are there are obvious uh, public health angles here as well, but I'm speaking particularly from the point of view of trials. But yeah, there, there are, as I said, there are challenges to doing this, and, and hopefully some of the people out there in the audience will take up the mantle here and, and do what they can to address this. But one thing that's relatively fundamental is the idea of biological heterogeneity versus intrinsic variability and the outcome measure. Yeah, ideally, what we'd like to do is essentially leverage what we can measure about biological heterogeneity to, to make these individualized prognoses. But there is you know, the, the limitation, and it might be fundamental for certain types of outcome, is the intrinsic variability in what we're measuring. And again, as we saw a few slides ago, something like ADAS COG or another clinical outcome measure has so much intrinsic variability that I think that's sort of a, a fundamental limitation. You know, how well can any measurement do, any, any prediction method do, when the measurement you're trying to uh, calibrate against is moving all around the place. And this comes to sort of the idea of a time scale of interest for a clinical trial. For someone who's in a symptomatic range, let's say a mystic MCI or, or early AD, trials are typically, let's say, one to two years. Um, and so there's huge, huge amount of bouncing around of these clinical outcomes on that time scale. Um, you know, from a Getting back to the public health angle, if you're interested in a time scale that might be five to eight years, then then maybe we can do a lot better, and then maybe that's the, the place to start. And again, as you got earlier in disease, the um, the amount of change becomes even more subtle, even though the time scale for trials might increase somewhat. Um, and this is related to the idea of you know what are we trying to predict? Um, what I've been sort of outlining in the in the previous cartoons was predicting an actual continuous outcome, be it a, 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 an, a cognitive instrument or a biomarker. Again, biomarkers might be more tractable in the near term just because the technical, the intrinsic variability is lower. Um, but been, there's been a lot of work in the field as well about predicting a dichotomous event. For example, is someone going to convert from NCI to AD within two or three years? Um, that's again coming back to a simplification of this, but it actually might have some uh, you know, some translation to reduce variability on the continuous outcomes as well. But something to bear in mind as you're developing these sort of methods is what's needed in terms of inputs. When you're dealing with something like ADNI, 
it's incredibly rich in terms of the uh, data available. And so it's tempting to throw all of those into a model. But, uh, and we know that many biomarkers have some sort of predictive value. But when you think about how this will be used in practice and trialed, and even more so in, in clinical practice, there are too many variables, and especially expensive and, and tricky biomarkers, may be impractical. And so the extent to which, again, that practicality can be traded off, I think is a very important uh, consideration. And when you are thinking about biomarkers, then of course, how those, how those are standardized uh, across sites, across trials, it really has to be thought about as well. Um, because not everyone, you know, these, these, are, these are research tools, uh, and not everybody's going to be reporting exactly the same values in the same way. And so the extent to which the inputs to the model can be widely applicable, that's, that's a really important thing to think about. And then finally, just as sort of the idea of run-in data, um, generally that's a, that's a really huge benefit for these sort of um, these sort of prognoses, because essentially the best predictor of uh, what's going to change in the future is what's happened in the recent past. The problem for trials is that uh, these have been, there hasn't been a big uptake of run-in designs just because of the, the extra time and delay required. Uh, but this is where something like trial-ready cohorts could be useful. Uh, and so that, again, needs to be made, made more explicit if run-in data is being used in the models. And even more considerations around the practicalities for clinical trials, how would we actually use it, um, not only in terms of what's needed, but where, that, where those data are going to come from in a clinical trial. Do we need to upload, for example, an image, if imaging data is one of the variables, uh, or is some summary value sufficient? And the reason why this is important is that in clinical trials, um, all the time under substantial time pressure, we engage different, uh, different companies to manage different aspects of the trial. Typically, you will have one company that's managing the, the clinical aspects, and so they'll have access to the demographics, maybe the genetics, the regenotype, um, any baseline cognitive assessment. But the imaging data will be handled by a different company, maybe two different companies. It's not unheard of to use a different imaging CRO for MRI than PET in a clinical trial. And so basically coordinating all of those things and the transfer of data sounds trivial, but it can be an absolute nightmare. And all of that within some sort of turnaround time that is acceptable to a company if this is going to be used for inclusion. And again, all the time with, with the pressure on screen fail rate as well as being something generally considered to be minimized. So as I say, this is, I think, a, a fantastic and, and fascinating area of work, but um, it has challenges. And so maybe we can come find some middle ground where we're not uh, attempting to predict individualized decline, but possibly some, so that we can maybe reduce at least a uh, a population to something like subtypes or subgroups. We, so we're getting some granularity and maybe those uh, groups of behavior may nevertheless be, be useful for trials, but also more tractable. And, you know, there's been a lot of work on that in, in recent years. And then some of the work has been around just looking, for example, identifying clusters of ADAS cold change based on baseline measurements, uh, genetics, and, and, uh, and demographics. And that potentially could have some use per se. But as an imaging, as an imaging guy, I'll talk a bit about uh, subtypes based on imaging here, um, partly because, to be frank, this is an area that I've been interested in, but I'm now sort of starting to think about exactly how or, or whether this would be useful for us sort of thinking about trials. And the angle I'm going to take is the approach that was originally um, popularized by Melissa Murray in this paper from nearly 10 years ago now, 2011. And this is based on a, a large uh, autopsy set, I think uh, from memory, something like 700 cases. And what was interesting is that these are all cases that have autopsy confirmed Alzheimer's disease. They all have sufficient amounts of amyloid and tau pathology in the brain to be. Um, histologically confirmed as, as Alzheimer's disease. That is the gold standard diagnosis. But what Melissa noticed was that 
despite that, there was actually quite some variability in the tau PET uh, presentation, sorry, the tau neuropathology presentation in the, in the brains of these subjects. And essentially, uh, you had almost the, the seesaw effect where um, some subjects had uh, uh, more than the usual amount of, of tau tangled density in the hippocampus, uh, but those same subjects would tend to have enough tangles in the broader neocortex to qualify as BRAC4, BRAC stage 4 and above, but it was relatively sparse. And, and, and others, uh, and vice versa, um, those subjects, uh, other subjects would, would tend to have um, uh, relatively dense tau pathology in the cortex, but relatively sparse, but non zero. Um, uh, tau tangle counts in the hippocampus. And there are other subjects that had a more, if you like, classical or quote unquote, uh, typical presentation. And so Melissa sort of came up with this scheme to try and break this population. It's really a continuum, but to sort of break into three, three subtypes, essentially based on um, percentiles of the, the, the counts in these different, different brain areas. And she, she named these sort of hippocampus sparing presentation, uh, limbic predominant presentation, and then the sort of the more typical AD presentation. This is based on, again, based on tau tangle counts in the, in the neuropathology brain. And, and as we started seeing about sort of five or six years ago, the first tau pet images, we were seeing what looked like maybe some, some similar patterns. And so the first, one of the first questions we asked was, um, does this, does this, uh, framework, does it generalize to what we can measure in tau pet? And there are several reasons for asking that question. Um, uh, one of the most important ones, of course, is that we're dealing now with people maybe slightly earlier in disease and still alive. And that the advantage of tau pet is that you can measure neuropathology in the living person. Um, but also, as we were just starting to evaluate this, uh, this was for Talsapia, the first, uh, first widely available tau pet tracer. Um, yeah, we were interested in any ways in which we could um, establish a correspondence between neuropathology and, and tau pet. And sure enough, this framework was able to very nicely recapitulate the same findings in, um, as was seen in neuropathology. This is a smaller sample, maybe around 50 subjects. Um, and whilst to some degree, the algorithm sort of finds these patterns by construction, the way it's, the way it's, the way it's built, um, th it's not a given that these lines would actually cross so nicely here. I mean, you could easily imagine scenarios where it's looking a lot more sort of scruffy in the middle in terms of how they how they uh, how they line up. But 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 in fact, what we saw was a very very similar behaviour, very beautifully recapitulating the neuropathological findings. Although you'll note that the hippocampus, the dynamic range with this tracer is, is much lower than in the neuropathology. It may be a resolution issue, it may be an artifact of this particular tracer, but essentially we saw very similar, uh, similar findings and the, the clinical correlates of these different, um, different subtypes also really lined up with what Melissa had observed in the uh, neuropathology, in particular the hippocampal sparing variant tends to do a lot worse on executive function. So this is, this is using tau pet, and I think a very nice idea of, sort of translating this into a tool that can be used in living people. But around the same time, we were also interested in whether these uh, subtypes uh, could be detected using measures of brain atrophy. And simplistically, we thought, well, you know, we know that tau drives atrophy a lot more proximally than, than amyloid. And so maybe, you know, maybe it still works for atrophy as well. And, and indeed, we found that the algorithm also works very, very beautifully uh, on measurements of, of brain atrophy. Again, this very nice recapitulation of of the pattern seen, partly by, by construction, admittedly, but I still think there are, you could easily scenarios where this would have played out a lot, um, a lot worse than it, than it did. In fact, this lines up very, very nicely again with, with the neuropathology, uh, but now we've sort of taken a step further and we're working with atrophy rather than direct measures of tau using PET. And again, uh, we find a similar uh, clinical correlate with the hippocampal sparing variant doing much worse on on executive function, and, you know, for, for some of the outcome measures as well, 
they progress more rapidly. So these are potentially relevant considerations for clinical trials. Um, but you know, we weren't the only people thinking about this. As we started uh, writing this up, it became apparent that a lot of other people were working in this area as well. Um, and this was sort of a quick and dirty overview of the field I, I did actually for the for a, a Europond meeting a couple of years ago, where uh, you know a, a number of people had published similar work. And what's actually kind of interesting is that everyone seemed to use a different uh, statistical or mathematical method, but the the findings were very very consistent. Basically, everyone found similar patterns of brain atrophy in the three subtypes and uh, similar clinical correlates as well. And you know, this work is, is continued. And more recently, there was a, a far more systematic uh, review published by Ferreira et al, um, showing that the, the prevalence of these is, is relatively consistent across different ways of grouping them. Uh, but again, you know, we were thinking this as well a couple of years ago. We never got around to actually uh, writing it up, but uh, just kind of comparing at the individual method level here, um, three different methods or two variants on the UCL method sustain, uh, again, showing you know, relatively uh, consistent uh, prevalence and, and other behaviors which were, uh, which were in, in this poster. And I'll just sort of put a nod out to this one, one of these three methods, which is one that we devised for use in, in clinical trials. Um, the trouble with a lot of the methods that were uh, shown previously uh, or developed previously is that they relied on having a large sample and running some statistical clustering or, or other approaches on those on those uh, on those measurements on that sample, whereas for use in clinical trials, ideally we have something that's applicable to individual subjects as they come in on an individual subject level. So we reduced the concept of these these uh, three subtypes, as well as basically a, a neurodegeneration negative subtype, based on a very simple decision rule, based on whether the cortex or the hippocampus. Was, was abnormal based on a Z-score type approach. So you can use things like the Icometrics method, which we've heard about, uh, for example, other methods also available to, uh, to essentially classify subjects in these three subtypes. And you, you achieve a very similar, uh, similar uh, performance as you see with the more, uh, the more uh, sophisticated mathematical approaches. So, you know, I think this is clearly a real phenomenon, be it based on atrophy or based on tau. And, but, and given the general similarity between anatomical patterns of tau and atrophy in AD, it's certainly tempting to interchange the two, although atrophy, of course, will be reflecting other, other uh, insults to the brain as well. And, you know, while a number of recent, recent studies have confirmed that this relationship tends to hold at the group level, it's certainly not perfect uh, once you get down to the individual Level. So again, just something to put out there um, that we do need to think about uh, what's driving the, the atrophy, uh, which may not maybe more than above tau. And if we want to do subtyping, what is the interpretation of that subtype if it's based on an atrophy outcome or if it's based on a tau outcome? But you know, although I was very sort of keen and active in this area um, recently, I've sort of uh, most recently started thinking, well how do we use this in a clinical trial and can we use it at all? I mean, one way of using it is a, is a post hoc analysis. And I actually tried this. It didn't seem to make much difference. It may have been because the trial was basically negative anyway, but it certainly didn't sort of pull a rabbit from the hat. Um, but, you know, why would we, how and why would we use these subgroups when we're actually running a clinical trial? And one of the reasons for, for thinking that is that if, uh, as we certainly are, and as probably the most popular approach in clinical drug development at the moment for Alzheimer's disease, if we're treating specific pathological drivers of dementia, and by this I mean amyloid or tau or one of the other underlying pathologies, then this approach doesn't really get at the most important question. The most important question, at least in Alzheimer's disease, is that of mixed pathologies. And this we can illustrate this with some neuropathology work that's uh, emerged in recent years. This is a few years old now, 2015, from, from ADNI. This is a, the first uh, report of the ADNI neuropathology uh, core. And really the takeaway messages, these are, again, these are based on, on brain autopsies, where you have gold standard uh, measurements of what's in the brains of these people. Um, all of these people 
33 individuals for the, uh, for the late onset AD from ADNI. All of them ha had amyloid and tau, so autopsy confirmed Alzheimer's disease. They all had neuropathologically defined Alzheimer's disease, but only less than half of them had only Alzheimer's disease because 58% uh, had other stuff in the brain as well. And if you do the math quickly on these, these percentages here, uh, many subjects had more than one of these. Um, whereas, interestingly, this is not the case in the autosomal dominant AD. People are, are much younger there. They're in their 40s rather than their 70s. Many of these are essentially age-related, so they, they don't appear. I mean, there's some really, something really interesting going on with, with the alpha-synuclein pathology, but uh, that's maybe a, a story for another day. Uh, and here's a more recent update of these data, that more subjects now, nearly, um, nearly twice as many, in fact, slightly more than twice, 69 subjects. Sorry, 67 subjects. And now 69% in this most recent analysis have other co-pathologies. So you're getting down to less than a third of your subjects have only Alzheimer's disease pathologies. They all have some combination of these others. Um, and as it happens, alpha-synuclein and TDP43 um, deposits are the most common co-pathologies. And so, you know, why should we care? Does this make a difference? And we care because, yes, it does make a difference. These are not, these pathologies are not silent. This slide is based on a, a very nice paper from the Rush group, where, again, they've taken autopsy data, but gone back to anti-mortem um, clinical measurements over many years prior to death. And uh, they've analyzed the relationship between these pathologies and, and cognitive decline. And the top left graph is really the money shot here. It really tells us that this is the, what's plotted here is that the fraction of um, cognitive loss that's due to just Alzheimer's disease pathology, which means Alta, uh, amyloid and tau, probably tau is the main driver here. And there, yeah, there are a few subjects that have basically all of their all of their cognition, according to this particular modeling exercise, is related to probably mostly tau. So, okay, fantastic. That's really good if we're developing therapies uh, against tau. But there's a huge range. The vast majority have a lower degree of their cognitive decline due to just, let's say, just tau. Um, and from, you know, a good half of this, this histogram here is less than 50% of their decline. And that is a concern, as I'll try and sort of make um, very obvious to you in, in, in a few cartoons in the next couple of slides. So consider an idealized clinical trial scenario. And this is basically the thought experiment that we, that we run when we're planning a clinical trial. So there might be some aging effect, but essentially your, you know, uh, your, your comparison is a very, a very limited cognitive decline, whereas in Alzheimer's disease, you have a, a more severe drop, especially maybe we can enrich the sample to help with that. Okay, fantastic. And we have a drug and we think it's really going to work well. And we, we base the power calculations around some assumption. Ideally, we have some data on this, uh, but often it's on it, to be frank, it's just an assumption about how we think we, we might assess that slow. We might slow it by, sorry, the decline. We might slow it by 50%, 30%, whatever it might be. Um, okay, but let's get a bit more specific with our thought experiment here. And let's assume that we're dealing with an anti-tau therapy. This is sort of very much the most popular um, uh, approach at the moment for therapies in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and let's assume, this is a, a thought experiment, so let's assume that it actually works and it does slow tau-related clinical decline by 50%. And I think hopefully you can see where I'm going here. The key words here are tau-related clinical decline. So if you have a trial participant that has no comorbidities, uh, and let's assume that most, you know, amyloid is not doing much, most of the decline is due to due to tau, then in this individual, because the drug, according to our assumption, the drug does actually work, you, you will actually detect within measurement noise, you'll detect on a bunch of subjects like this, a 50% uh, decline. Fantastic. But as we've just learned, most subjects have other things going on in the brain. And so you have participants with other comorbidities that are contributing to cognitive decline, even though our drug is being perfectly efficacious, um, the, the treatment effect is going to be massively attenuated just because we're including participants uh, that, that have other things, other things contributing to their cognitive decline. 
so obviously this is going to be reducing overall average um, effect size and it's going to be from a, in an absolute sense and it's also going to be increasing the variability. So we've got exactly the sort of things we're trying to get away from when we want more effective trials. And so this is in a nutshell, this is the, the real issue and for me for Alzheimer's disease, this is the crux of what we want to try and get at um, in a more, shall we say, a smarter personalized medicine approach. So just, just summarizing what I've just said, mixed pathologies, mixed pathologies are common in old age, especially sporadic dementia. Um, contributions of non-AD pathologies are present more often than not in these older populations. And this is, you know, screening people for amyloid and tau is not going to get away from this. These people are all amyloid positive and tau positive, but they still have this biological, uh, I would call it noise, but that's a sort of harsh way, it's a biological reality, a harsh way of uh, describing it. These pathologies are not silent. They contribute to cognitive decline. And so if we want to think about a more personalized medicine approach, um, if we're targeting AD, knowing that it is a mixed dementia, um, there are a number of considerations. I mean, these first two are the things we've already been thinking about, and there's been a lot of thinking in the field about this. So does the person have the target pathology? Okay, are they tau positive? Fine, we can do that. Is the person going to decline appreciably over the time scale of interest? Okay, again, we can think about that. We can do some exercises and enrich for faster decline. But what we really need to get at as well is this third piece, which hasn't been thought about as much, is is the clinical decline due in large part to the mechanism to be treated or not? Obviously, biomarkers for this would be would be helpful. Um, it's been a challenge for some of these, these non-AD pathologies, so-called. Um, but I'm really hoping, and I'm sort of closing now, and I'm pleased for this audience, is can quantitative modeling approach is also helping. Um, I don't know why you're getting in the same direction. We do have biomarkers. It's still going to be a cost and, and, uh, uh, and a burden on the participant. And really, again, coming back to the idea of enrichment, which has been a, one of my main themes today, I think in addition to trying to get at the homogeneous behavior of the enrolled participants, I think we need to get back to um, uh, getting beyond that and thinking about uh, a homogeneous pathology of the enrolled participants as well. And this is really, really important as a biological lever in addition to a purely statistical lever, depending, of course, on how we're treating this disease. This is assuming that we're treating the disease, uh, one of the upstream drivers like tau or potentially alpha-synuclein or TDB43. If we're treating something downstream, a sort of a synaptic target, it may be less of an issue. But the big, uh, the big game in the field at the moment is, is tau, and we really need to be a lot cleverer about doing so. And I hope, I hope that computational approaches can sort of be part of our arsenal to help us get at that. So with that final thought, uh, again, just sort of coming beyond the statistics uh, and thinking about what is causing the decline, how it relates to the treatment that we actually are intending to test and eventually apply to, uh, to patients. Um, we need to be able to get at that in a much cleverer, personalized medicine approach. And so with that, I will close. I will thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take any 